Chapter 13 in, in Romans, if you look at the little headings uh, in the in the chapter breaks there, or maybe your Bible doesn't have those, but mine does, and the very first one says submit to the government. So we're going to skip that one. And I mean, he uh, talks about honoring the people who are in authority over you. We're all going to be dealing with that in the next couple of weeks, paying your taxes that are due. And and it's it and not really nothing. To, none of this is new. We'll, we'll read through that, but I really want to focus on the second half of the chapter and in, in a little bit, possibly into chapter fourteen. Here, but uh, I'll start with verse one. It says, "Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, uh, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God." And guys, whoever we end up with, um, as disappointing as it'll be one way or the other, whatever your whatever your preference is. Um, like I said before, it's two things. We, we've brought this on ourselves. And not only that, this is also who God is going to appoint, whether it's because of our own conduct and the conduct of the people and we're getting what, we're, what we deserve. And you heard me mention even in my prayer, recognizing that that was an instruction to Israel in, in 1 Samuel, that if you... If uh, Samuel was addressing the people, if you will follow the Lord your God, then your king will. And if you don't, your king won't. You know, it, it, we like to make it the other way around. We think we can elect guys in there that are going to be good guys and 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 righteous guys, and everything's going to turn around. It's not the way it goes. It, it it starts with the people. And it doesn't matter what country you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in a communist country or if you're in a free country like ours. If it's got to start with the people, that's what affects the leadership and, and, and takes them in the direction that, they're, that they need to go. Because you, you, a, a righteous population um, will override the unrighteous man who's in office one way or another. It doesn't matter what form of government you're in. It doesn't matter if it's a monarchy like Israel was or if it's a, a free uh nation like we are supposed to be it, 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 that doesn't matter it, righteousness starts with the people it doesn't start with the government and so that's we, we, we tend in America to have that flipped backwards there but that being said so two things there is, God has appointed them and, and we participate in this at our level of understanding and that we go and we vote we have the right to do it I think it's incumbent upon us because God has put us in a nation where we have the right to go and exercise that right. And and ultimately, what we do in that booth is not so much about what goes on and who ends up in office as much as it is our conviction between us and God. That's a private moment between you and the Lord. What you do with what he's given you to be able to do. you know, It doesn't matter if the system's rigged or not. The hole you punch, the button you push, whatever, the lever you throw, that's between you and the Lord at that point. Nobody else sees that. It doesn't matter if it ultimately counts or not. That's kind of the the way that I've I've dealt with this, because you can see the conspiracies, you can talk about the system being rigged or everything being one way or the other, and and some of it's got some truth to it, and some of it is you know imagination and whatever. But the reality of it is, what I do in that voting booth is between me and the Lord, and He's the only one who's right there with me all the time. It's, it's not any different than what I do alone in a car, alone in a store, alone out in the woods. I'm never alone. So that's one thing to think, one way to think about this. But the other thing is, too, um, we look at the big picture. And w when we talk and we look at all this stuff that's going on in the world, we say to each other over and over again, I wish the Lord would just come back. I wish he could just come back. This can all be done. And we, we even look at the way things are forming up in the Middle East. We see prophecies that are either being fulfilled or set up to be fulfilled soon, that point to the end, that point to his soon return. And, and we're just, we long for that more and more. Well, if you read, when we read, those prophecies of the very last days, it doesn't talk about any good guy there. Everybody's bad. You know, Jesus talks about that in Matthew as it was in the days of Noah and he goes on to talk about them just doing business as usual married getting married 
eating whatever. But also, when you go back and read the story of Noah, every thought of every man was continually evil. And, and that's what we live in. So there's, there's no promise of anybody coming in on a white horse except Jesus. There's our superhero, right? There's our, there's our savior. We, we forget that that's who he is. That, that's our king, you know? And, and we can get caught up in the very moment without remembering to look ahead and, and understand. So these people are appointed for this time. The whole world is as corrupt as it is because, well, God let men do what men wanted to do. He didn't force himself on them, and this is the result of the free will of men. And he's raised up then people from among them, just like he raised up Nebuchadnezzar, just like he raised up Cyrus, just like he raised up some of the others in the Old Testament. The bad guys, he raised them up. He put them in place to carry out his will, whether they knew what they were doing or not. So, anyhow. This is therefore... Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do, uh, uh, do you want to be unafraid of the, author of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. When we look at these guys and we go, uh, he, he's the ministry, he, he ministers good to those who do good. And, and we hear the campaign promises and for the most part, there's not a lot of promise for doing what's right in the sight of God, having good put on it or having good rewarded for good. But, so what, what in the world was Paul thinking of? Well, Paul has, I think at this time, Nero as, as his world leader. And he's still writing these words. But you also have the local governments who would reward good for good. And, and I can say from our experience in the last two years, we have local guys who are good guys. And, and even if they're not completely good, e even, even sitting in a room full of people who were not good or welcoming or believers at all, still to have God work through those people and say the things that needed to be said, even though they were about choking on the words, see, they don't always have control over what they're going to do. When God works in a situation... God works in the situation. You want to live, and I think, didn't we see that in Timothy? You want to live a peaceable life? Then you be at peace. Be a peaceful person. And it's all he's saying here. The same thing. You know, if you're where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing, and there's always the, the, the uniqueness of a situation, but be where you're supposed to be, do what you're supposed to be doing, and you don't have to be afraid. And ultimately, even if they decide, hey, Christians are all bad and you're all going to jail, that's still something we don't have to be afraid of. I mean, for one thing, the prison population will then be where all the righteous people are at. <laughs> and we'll have, we'll have walls and fences around us to keep all the bad guys out. So, you know, it's a different way to look at it, but we'll all, we'll all still be together. Yeah, the church will just be behind razor wire and bars. We'll, we'll all still be together. <laughs> I don't know. It's a different way to look at it, I guess. But anyhow. Where are we at? Verse 5. Therefore, you must, be, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. And there you go. It's not just about avoiding wrath. It's about your own conscience, where you stand before God, regardless of what the other guy does. This is... For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending uh, continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear 
In other words, respect to those to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now we're contrasting men's laws and regulations, which actually should be founded upon the Lord. And even, even with wicked people in charge, most of the laws are still founded or have derived from God's law. Right? So, but if we love one another, we're outside of everything else. We're outside of man's control. We're walking in the will of, of God. And we have fulfilled his law. It says, there are for the commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, you are, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so you'll recognize the first ones as part of the Ten Commandments, the other is in Leviticus, the last one there, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but you'll also recognize that from the testing of a Pharisee to Jesus and Lord, who, what is the greatest commandment? And so well, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And even a Pharisee who's trying to trip up Jesus has to agree with him. You're right. You've answered wisely. That's, that's our goal to love our neighbors as ourselves. And, and it is incumbent upon us to do first, to make that a proactive way of life. You don't love somebody because they love you. You love somebody whether they do or not. It's a conscious decision. It's not an emotion. It's full of emotions, but it's not an emotion. It is a decision to live your life a certain way. You know, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that whole thing is about how to love somebody. That whole chapter is about love. It defines love. And so love is a way of life. It's a conscious decision we make every single day. Verse 11. Uh, well, I think I left the first ten. Love does no harm to neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11. Uh, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us uh, put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife, not in envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. It's Paul saying the day's at hand. He was living like Jesus could come back at any time, you know, in, in his lifetime. He wasn't, he wasn't looking for Jesus to come back some, you know, 2,000 years after he died. He lived like Jesus could come back at any time. And that's what he's telling us right here. Just, this is how you live because this is who you are. And because he could come back at any time, you don't want him finding you doing something that you shouldn't have been doing to begin with. You know, we all know that feeling from being a kid trying to get away with something and you turn around and dad or mom is standing right there. And you're like, oh. and, and regret floods in really fast. And if it doesn't flood in fast enough, dad makes it flood in faster. You know, <laughs> as soon as his lips start to move, judgment's coming. You know it. All right. It's time for us to wake up, and it's time for the church to wake up. And I've been hammering this, and and I think revival is necessary for the church to be an influence in our nation. It's got to wake up. It's got to wake up to sound doctrine. It's got to wake up to to loving one another, to acting out what we believe, living out what we believe. You know, not just to come in and tolerate the pastor talking about it, but to pick it up as instruction and commandment from our king and go out and live that way beyond the walls without looking at each other and wondering if that guy's letting go. Because we'll be so distracted by whether somebody else is loving people enough or not. You know, forget about it. Go out 
and and love people. And not because they love you, because they don't. They don't know how. Go out and love people anyways. And and you see people turn around. You see people are uh, want to start to be like you. They want they want to know what is motivating you in your life. Why why don't you complain like everybody else at work? Why why don't you stick things in your pockets and just say, well, they can afford to, you know, not have this and walk out the door. Why don't you fly off the handle when things aren't right or aren't fair? You know, why aren't you in that guy's face? He he did something to offend you. Well, I've done an awful lot to offend God. And rather than him being in my face all the time, you know, and I admit sometimes it feels like it and sometimes I probably need it. I need to go out to the woodshed every once in a while and get straightened out. But for the most part, loving, caring, God says, hey, you know, if I say to him, I, I'm sorry. I, I blew it. I don't have a bunch of excuses, just I'm sorry. Forgive me. Let's go. Well, we just keep moving forward. We don't need to go back and relive it. Let's keep moving forward. You know, so it, we, we need to walk this way. We need to walk as though the Lord is coming back at any time. Peter addresses this in Second Peter uh, concerning men and who who would say that hey, you guys have been saying for a long time he's coming back, and and that kind of thing is not even just outside in the world anymore. That's in the church. There are denominations whose seminaries teach that there is no second coming of Christ. You know, these are the people who are supposed to be teaching men and women to go and be ministers, and, and they're not sending them out to be ministers of the truth anymore. They're sending them out to be ministers of a lie. You're not sending them out with the hope and build the church up and, and encourage the church and, and make sure they know they have hope. It, it is sending them out with no hope. It's telling them, you know, they really do come from apes. There, there's no real Adam, no real Eve in spite of what the Bible says about it. You know, you can take the first part of Genesis and throw it out. Well, what do you do with Romans? Because in Romans chapter 10, I think, Paul talks about sin entering the world through one man and then being defeated by one man. You know, you can't just throw out the bathwater and think the baby's staying in the tub. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> Paul will say this, but the <clears throat> verse nine of chapter three in, in Second Peter. I'm sorry, Peter say this: the Lord is not slack concerning his promises; some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and. The elements w will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth <clears throat> and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, burning, <laughs> being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we we, according to his promise, look for a new have for new heavens and new earth, uh, in which righteousness dwells. And again, so he's, he's addressing the conduct in the last day, looking forward to that time. The guys, looking forward to it so much that it hastens the day. You really want Jesus to come back, live holy, live a holy life before him, like you don't have a tomorrow. You know, even even if it was taking another 20 years, even if it was taking another 50 years. When you're working, if you're busy working, your day goes a lot faster. I mean, you'll look up and you go, where did my day go? I didn't have enough time to get everything done. But when you're when 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 work is slow, it takes forever for it to get by. You want the you want the day of the Lord to come faster or at least seem like it's coming faster. Be about his business. Be about his work. 
in knowing that it could happen at any time. You know, and, and they all try to tell us everything began with a big bang. Everything's going to end with a big bang. Loud noise, fervent heat, you know, everything's going to melt and burn up. And that's when, the, that's when the real destruction is coming, real bang is coming. But anyways, just <coughs> that's my thing lately. This is where starting off with trying to focus on prayer has brought me to his time to wake up. You know, and, and they're both still, to me, extremely important for the church. The church to begin to pray again like we've never prayed before. The church to live holy again like we've never lived before. And the only way to do that is to wake up. To get rid of all this other stuff. We've had a great time back here talking about football teams and whatever. But the reality of it is there's people outside that door that are perishing. And this moment that we long for, for Jesus to come back and take us home, that means people die and go to hell. And and so our, our mission and our commission has not changed since Jesus gave it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And make disciples everywhere you go. So not just go out and, and preach the gospel and give an altar call and then go away, but go out and then invest in those people your knowledge, what you know. And, and that in itself is going to keep you going back to the Lord. Lord, pour more into me so I can keep pouring more out. Peter says, what kind of conduct should you be about? Paul says, let us walk properly. And Paul says that in every epistle. We've gone through almost all of them now on Sunday mornings. Every single one. Walk worthy of the name. Walk properly. Walk circumspectly. Walk in holiness. Be holy because your God is holy. You know, and Peter is the same way. John was the same way. We are never off the hook for holiness. That's how we're supposed to walk. And, and not probably in an Americanized version of holiness because that is too often just compromise. And that leads to a lukewarm walk. And there's a, you know, the, the warning of, from Jesus himself to the Laodicean church to that last church age. I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. You know, and you, you hear people and, and you hear these pastors and, and people who have great influence on great numbers of people and the things that they say are contrary to God's word and they are setting those people into just a, a lukewarm, at best, walk with the church, not even with God. But that, that letter has a promise with it, just like every other one, it, to him who overcomes. And I don't remember what the reward is to the Laodicean church, but it's still there. To him who overcomes, that mindset, that attitude of, I don't need God. That is not true. That is, there's a promise there. There's a promise to every single one of those churches. The shortfalls to the churches and, and the the wrong ideas and the wrong theologies to each one of those churches, except for the two who don't have anything bad written about them. But even to them, their, their letters end with to him who overcomes. You know, we're to be overcomers because Jesus overcame the world. And, and we're to live like it. And, and I only keep saying it because I have to keep dealing with it on a daily basis myself. There's not anybody immune to the fight of having to put down the things of the flesh. Every single person, every single Christian has to fight that fight every single day. And we lose some battles, but we know we've already won the war. So we, we go to him, we ask for forgiveness. The letter that John wrote where he says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness that was written to a church. It wasn't written to a bunch of non-believers that he was trying to get saved. He wasn't being Franklin Graham or Billy Graham then. He was being John to a church. Remember to go and remember to ask for forgiveness. Remember, we still sometimes if we fall, we got to get up and repent, which means to turn around and walk the other way. 
You know, we stay on the straight path. And even if we think our walk isn't good enough to matter for anything, isn't good enough to count for anything, and listen, as a pastor who for about 25 years of ministry from being with youth leader or as a youth leader on up to today, to not have very many come to the Lord, only a few, that gets discouraging sometimes. But I can't worry about that. I have to be faithful to what God's called me to do. I have to be faithful to do it and keep going forward. And you guys, just because you don't get a lot of people turning to the Lord, giving their heart to the Lord, you never know when you're going to strike gold on that. You know? You you needed to be here the Wednesday that they brought Lance. It turned into a, a Bible study, turned into just a... Dis- he asked one question, and then it just was me. And I'm just... And it wasn't just me. It wasn't me at all. And and just me me, is a conversation between the Lord and Lance, and he was just using me to do it. And it was, it was amazing. I don't know what it was like for everybody else. I mean, I've heard other people talking about it, but for me to know, I, Lord, I don't even know where all this is coming from. He just asked one question and I just blah for like a half an hour. My mouth was going and, and just me and him. Like we were the only two in the room, you know, but then on the next Sunday, he gets saved, gives his heart to the Lord. Yeah, he wasn't here Sunday morning. He was supposed to be. Dave told him to be here Sunday morning. He didn't show up Sunday morning, but he showed up at his house and and made Dave go all day with him, you know, or made the Lord go through Dave all day with him. It is. It's exhausting. It, it, It really is when. Part of you, when it's all done, part of you is just pumped, and the other part is like, I need to sleep because everything pours out, and it's amazing. And and those moments are are worth all of the what I look at as unsuccessful moments. But God doesn't look at those as unsuccessful. You guys, you guys are planting seeds. We don't know. I was so down when he left here and didn't commit his heart to the Lord. I thought, man, a couple of times, I should just tell him now, come up here and pray because I think I think he's I think he's ready. And he's like, no, you guys can pray for me, but and we did. We got up around him, we prayed for him, and he walked out. And I'm going, Lord, what happened? I thought he had him in the net, you know. In a couple of days like that, the rest of that week like that, and then then he doesn't show up on Sunday, and I'm like, oh. he's getting away. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, he wasn't getting away. The Lord was reeling him in instead of me. That was what really what was happening. You know, he got him where he needed to be, and and now his, and now Ricky, his girlfriend. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys, man, these these are the moments that I keep. I I, I long for those to happen. You know, and. and I would I would love to come in on a Sunday morning, see the place packed out, and people just come forward. You give an altar call, be like, you know, Franklin Graham or Greg Laurie. Those guys sneeze and people get saved. It just, you know, they they give the same message I do. And, you know, but thankfully it's not as bad as Jeremiah's ministry. I mean, he went forty years and not a single convert. So you know. And then you have Jonah who goes in with a bad attitude and you know, 40 days and you're all toast and the whole city turns to God. And he was like, wait a minute. He didn't even enjoy it, man. He went out and I can't believe I knew you weren't going to destroy him. I knew you'd forgive him. And you know, you don't, we don't get to see the end of that story. He says what he's got to say, but whatever God said 
didn't get written. So, anyhow. No, I don't think so. I think God set him straight and then just loved him until he was time to come home. That's do with me. So. All right, so P- Paul goes on. I'm going to go ahead and end, but Paul goes on from here and talks about receiving those who are weaker in the faith and not judging those. You know, if you decide you're just going to eat vegetables, don't judge the guy who eats meat. And if you're going to be an e- a meat eater, don't judge the guy who's eating vegetables. And 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 it's just it's a a small thing, but it's a it's of a look through bigger aspects of our walk with the Lord and where the Lord has us. You know, any, any, you know, don't, if we're worried more about loving on one another, we're not worried so much about judging whether they're producing enough fruit or not. You know, we, we walk with each other. We carry the ones who are weaker in the faith until they're strong enough to walk with us. And, you know, we, we put up with a lot. We don't do things in front of them that are going to cause them to to fall and stumble, even though we're okay with what we're doing. You know, we, we, we're we servants, man. We don't go up to God and say, this is my right. Or to all the other believers, this is my right to do this. I can do this. We don't do that. We, we are, I mean, there's enough military terms in Paul's teachings and all of his teachings to know just like a military man you you have the rights but in some respect you're giving up those rights to protect somebody else who has those rights and maybe don't don't know how to walk in them and don't know how to use them you know our, our guys in the military protect the right of people to speak freely about how much they hate the military and they go and they do it. They, just, they don't think about that. They just know the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to go do what I got to do. And it's the same thing for us. You know, we, we, we guard the little Christians, the younger Christians, as much as we can. The, those who are weak in the faith or new to the faith. And we try to build them up. And some days they're going to bite us. Some days they're going to throw up on us. It's what babies do. And... And sometimes they're going to try to walk and they're going to fall and they're going to want what they want and they're going to cry. And we're going to tend to them because that's what we're supposed to do. And and we know, we know they're going to walk someday. We know they're going to chew solid food someday. We know, you know, and we put up with it for a while. And, and, And we're not the ones, you know, there's time to correct, but we correct by God's word. We don't correct by our own emotions because if we do that we're just going to tear them up and start all over again so anyhow it, it, he's really going against the law of, of, of legalism in the next like, it says the law of liberty but he's explaining liberty and and legalism and comparing them in the next couple of paragraphs there and then comes back full circle to love how, how do you conquer legalism you conquer it with love you know so you know, and we've got a lot of that coming up in the next couple of months because you got holidays coming up, and some people don't think that you ought to do Christmas because you know there's things in it that were paganism, and yeah, I didn't know they were pagan until I grew up, and somebody told me they were pagan when I was growing up. You know, Christmas tree was never green tree, everlasting life. Woo! That's all I know. I didn't have any idea it had anything tied to Babylon and all the other stuff that it's tied to. Didn't care. All I knew was everything about Christmas in our house either had something to do with right and good or directly to Jesus. You know? I understand now. It came from paganism. There was a lot of it mixed in there. Jesus wasn't actually born on December 25th. Get it don't know what day he was born on so let's just pick a day and celebrate his birthday all right there we go you know i don't know guys the bible talks about a day he was born and we pick a day and celebrate it awesome we know the day he was crucified we know that day we celebrate that day 
celebrate the day he came out of the tomb. You know, but we're going to come into a season where some people are going to be legalistic about it, and some people are, and, you know, it just, it is. So if somebody only likes to listen to hymns and they're in your car, don't put on the contemporary stuff. Put on hymns for them. Let them listen to them. That way you can talk about deeper things to God. You're not talking about arguing about whether you should only be listening to hymns or you should be listening to rock and roll. It don't matter. That's That issue is a distraction from the real issues. What is God? Who is God? What is the love of God? He's coming back. What about the prophecies? What about what about his word? Forget about hymns. Forget about rock and roll. Forget about Christmas trees, shepherds, whatever. Don't let that legalism. Now, it's all Paul is saying in the rest of that chapter. Don't let legalism bind you up and get you distracted off of the main issue, and that's to love that person and to build them up in the Lord. Anyhow, let's end there tonight. And, and uh, let's have a great a great service. Hopefully we all have good services tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for our opportunity to be together. And, and Lord, I do ask that you would bless those who are going to be meeting tomorrow to worship you and and to serve in the churches tomorrow. And uh, Lord, I pray that we all go to church tomorrow ready to serve in whatever capacity you would have for us. Um, give us the strength and the wisdom to do that, to honor you, to not be seeking any kind of self-gratification in that, but just to honor you in whatever we do. And I pray it will be a great day for our brothers and sisters everywhere. And we pray for those who won't be meeting in secret. We pray for those who are losing their lives, who are imprisoned because of their faith in you. And I just pray that you would give them strength and, and comfort and courage and uh, what a great example they are to us. Lord, I pray that we would honor you with our lives tonight, tomorrow, the rest of the time we have here, whether you come back to get us all or whether we go home first and are resurrected to new life. You know our days. You know the number of our days. And that, Lord, for me is reassuring to know you have that much control over my life. And I pray that most days it makes it that much easier for me to give you each day. To live for you. To honor you. And again, Lord, we just pray for our nation. In the next couple of days, I'm sure we'll be wild and crazy. And Lord, help us to to know what is good and right and true in your eyes as we go and participate in this election or or to not. In Jesus' name, amen.